So does anybody need clarification on that conceptual amendment? It's just, it's essentially just dates. Um, so before the commission terminates and policies rather than regulations and rather than obtaining information, it's receiving and analyzing the information. And did you move the conceptual amendment number That's one? the conceptual amendment number <laughs> one to amendment number eight. So that's the conceptual amendment. We could have Ms. Wilkerson come up if there is an objection. Is there an objection to uh, conceptual amendment number one? Seeing no objection, I think we're okay. Um, and so the conforming amendments will be, uh, or, or language will be made at the very end of our process here today. So um, with that conceptual amendment uh, number one to amendment number eight has been adopted. And uh, Representative Kawasaki has explained amendment number eight. So are there any questions? We have a question from Representative Gren and then Guttenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, would partaking in this be voluntary? I just want to clarify, I'm trying to find something that's... Yep, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, the uh, information that's received under LSIR is, uh, is uh, voluntary information, um, completely voluntary. Representative Guttenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Four, ses four sessions ago, that's still this year, <laughs> 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 there was a Homeland Security issued a... Um, a request, a national request for, for um, uh, I think it was prison systems around the nation for information on their, on their database. And I remember doing some research and finding some restrictions that the state have had on disseminating some of that information on um, ethnicity and country of origin and stuff like that and, and things of that nature. I haven't been able to find it. Um, uh, just very recently when I'm looking for it, but I'm wondering if um, how the conflict between that and this is um, uh, uh, c conflicted by itself. And I'm wondering, um, I know the, the data collection for the, for the commission will be public, and I'm wondering if that information will be part of that also. Representative Kawasaki. Hmm. Um, well, I I guess uh, through the chair, I'm not actually sure what data will be um, public data. I, I know that the requests had to deal with an individual's uh, country of origin. Um, since this will probably, this will be mostly aggregated data that could be used as a, uh, as a tool to decide, uh, you know, I mean, a great example is why are Alaska Natives um, overrepresented in jail to twice, 100%. Um, more than uh, Caucasian folks. I, I think those are the types of aggregated data that we will gather that will be useful in, uh, in creating primary prevention plans. I don't think individual data now is released. That's a question for correction, so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Any Representative Seaton? Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chair, uh, and for the Maker of the amendment on page two, uh, line 16, um, where it's saying uh, may not publish or present individually identified yeah. information relating to an inmate. Uh, does that carry throughout so that um, not only in that specific report, but this is meant to, to say that only de-identified information will be made public, is, is that correct? Through the chair, um, Representative Seaton, that's correct. The annual report would summarize data. It would be for informational purposes. It wouldn't identify particular people. Um, and then that information would also be uh, confidential. Representative Seaton? So, so just to follow up, although this is relating to make a report required on this uh, subsection, <clears throat> the legislative intent is that any publicly released information, whether it's in that report or in, other, in any other form, would be de-identified data. Is so, Representative Kawasaki? Yeah, through the chair, that would be my intent, is the information is, um, is strictly confidential to the, and not identifiable to the person or to the individual. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to get that on the House Finance record, that that was the intent of House Finance, was that this would be all the identified data. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions of the committee? Seeing no questions, is your objection maintained, Representative Wilson? No, I withdraw my objection. The objection is withdrawn. Are there any further objections? Seeing no further objections, amendment number eight, which is 30-LS0461 backslash T.15 is adopted with conceptual amendment number one. And Representative Kawasaki, would you um, make a motion for amendment number nine? Thank you, Mr. S uh, Mr. Chairman, I move amendment number nine. Object. We have an objection, Representative Kawasaki, if you could explain your amendment. Sure. Um, amendment number nine is pretty simple, and I do have a lot of um, data to back up um, the request. Um, amendment number nine essentially sets a uh, upper cap for uh, probation caseloads, uh, pr probation and parole caseloads at 75. Um, there is a lot of data that states that um, the total number of uh, probationers or parolees that are supervised um, uh, as that number increases, uh, so does the impact, the net impact on um, whether those probationers and parolees are actually making it through the program. Uh, a study done in 2012 called Reduce Caseloads, Improve Probation Outcomes um, in the Journal of Crime and Justice studied that particular impact and they estimated that a smaller caseload uh, could reduce recidivism by roughly 30 percent. Um, that is, it's just sort of understood that at some level, um, at some level, you're, um, when a probation officer has too many cases, they just can't keep track of um, each of the folks um, that's under their supervision. Part of uh, Senate Bill 91 and House and Senate Bill 54 are specifically meant um, to put these low-risk offenders on probation and parole um, back into the streets. Um, I think that reentry, uh, reinvestment, and rehabilitation is very important, um, and that those folks uh, deserve the best chance that they can uh, while they're out there. So, um, with that, I do have some more data, but I'll spare the data until there might be a question about it. I got a question from Representative Wilson. So, what is the current um, recidivism or probate those on probation and/or parole? currently as of like 2016-17? Sure. Uh, through the chair, Representative Wilson, the, the latest data that we got was 2016 and it was through a report published by Legislative Research Services um, which showed the average recidivism rate was hovering right around 65 percent. Follow-up? Follow-up. So the recidivism rate for probation on and parole is the same recidivism as for those who are getting out that aren't on probation or parole? Because that was about the same number we already heard. Representative Kawasaki? Uh, through the chair, I'm actually not sure what that, that number is, but I can tell you that for probation and parole supervised, the rate is roughly 65%. And Mr. Chairman? Representative Wilson? Um, can we bring up the Department of Corrections because this will also affect pretrial? and their anticipation on how many they may be having in January um, being able to be out on their own recognizance will take place. So I'm not sure how this might affect the number of people that they see as that program comes in. Commissioner Williams, would you like to bring your team up? If you could put yourself on the record. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Dean Williams, the Commissioner for the Department of Corrections. Um, can I hear that one more time? Through the Chair, Representative Wilson, can I hear it one more time? Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So pretrial will begin in January um, to where we'll be looking at, I'm assuming, those who are currently in jail, currently awaiting trial, as well as anybody else who starts coming in the system, who will uh, be being monitored, as the representative said. Do you have an anticipated number that will initially be going through and how that pertains to how many officers you currently are looking to hire to be able to you know, watch the movement and, and make sure that plans are being taken care of? Yeah, and through the Chair, Representative Wilson, um, my, my pretrial director is also here, and so 
if I miss this, she can take a stab at it as well. I, I think this amendment, by my reading of the intent of it, and I may have this wrong, could Im impact that, um, that issue. One of the things under pretrial is that there are some people we're going to put on sort of monitoring status, which means that they're still under a caseload, but we're not going to um, follow them the way we would with other people who are on pretrial status or getting out or at higher risk. Research says if someone's a low risk person under a pretrial status, the best thing you can do is not to do anything except to remind them of their court date because over monitoring low risk people like one of us would get in trouble. We've never been in trouble before. It's bad. So it could, it, it, we may have them considered on the case status for that. So it could impact in terms of what we would do there if that was the intent. It would, it could potentially restrict how many people we have on those uh, caseloads. And follow up, Mr. Chairman? Follow up. So just looking at the numbers coming come January, because I imagine you know how many are currently sitting in institutions awaiting trial who couldn't bail themselves out for whatever reason. What approximately is that number? Um, through the Chair, uh, Representative Wilson, that's a question I really would like the Director to answer if, if that uh, would be acceptable. Or if you could also put yourself on the record. Yes, good morning. Jerry Fox, pretrial director. Um, and um, through the chair, Representative Wilson, could you repeat it? I apologize that I didn't catch the question. No problem. And Mr. Chairman, so right now it was our last understanding in the institutions that approximately a third of those who are in, in the institution are awaiting trial. A third of them probation, parole, violations of some kind, and a third have been sentenced. So I'm just trying, you know, as January comes here, do you have at least a ballpark number of those initial ones that you'll be looking at to see whether or not through their screening process they'll be able to get on their own recognizance. Um, through the Chair Representative Wilson, we, we are anticipating it. So, so the way that you're asking that I'm not sure that I would have that directly in front of me, but I've, I've anticipated a potential of caseload sizes of approximately 200. Um, and that may give you a sense for what um, you're looking at. I also perhaps need to clarify that um, this language, as I read it, um, could impact the pretrial caseload. I think it specifically says probation, but we do have some areas that will be a dual caseload where, where a person has probation and pretrial. So I think that that distinction um, maybe does it potentially have some impact when we look at the way that this is worded and some of the realities of how the work will be assigned. And follow up? Follow up. And how many current officers do you have hired or, or anticipate will be hired by the time you begin this in, Janu in January? We think we'll be close to 40 hired by January. Um, we have approximately 10 right now that we hope to be able to make offers to. Um, yeah. The follow-up? Follow-up. And, and so um, 40, but the 40 officers so I wouldn't just take 40 times 200 to come up with the number of people you think are getting out because I don't want to scare people either and make it look like that we're going to basically release everybody um, by that number. So that 40 you're talking about probably has, you talk about office help and, and screening, not just boots on the ground who would be the ones who are following up on those who have been released. Through the chair to Representative Wilson, um, I have tried to take every possible PCN to put it at the line level for supervision. We do have um, some very minimal administrative support in each of the areas, but the bulk of these P 